Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young. We are here as uh, football is unofficially, unofficially started now. Because, uh, again, we'll get another period in uh, the, the late summer, uh, except we're all going to call it fall. Uh when you know there's the the month long practices before you get to games, this is a, a little teaser for everybody. Uh, thank goodness, though, that you know everybody in K State land doesn't have to suffer through a miserable spring game like other places make you do. Uh, I just I I personally want to thank Chris Kleiman for not having a spring game. They are the most worthless, dumbest things on earth. Uh, and I know that some people like it, but, you know, newsflash, the reason you like it is because sometimes the weather's nice and you can just, you know, go watch a sport and drink. There are thousands of other ways that you can go drink and watch a sport. It does not have to be a pathetic, worthless excuse for a football game. So uh, death to all spring games. And I honestly, I'm, I'm not calling anybody out here. It's going to sound like it. Um, so I'll just disparage myself. If I ever went to a spring game willingly, I would call myself a clown uh, because I just I can't stand spring games. I think they are the dumbest things ever. Uh, maybe you feel less passionately about that than me. Probably less passionate, but I do agree. Um, I'll just say this. They're just not even closely worth remotely the risk that it can be. If you, I mean, because you're going full contact. Now you protect your quarterback, some of the other guys. But a lot of times, like, your main players are playing a quarter if that, um, and you're, you're, I like the way Chris Klein explains it. Um, one, like I said, the, the main contributors aren't playing that much. So there's not a whole lot to glean from it. And two, I, this is what he says. And I love it. Uh, I've, I've looked at Kansas state's 2024 football schedule this year. Kansas state is not on it. Good point. It's a good point by him. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what comes out of it for, you know, other teams and everything else. And also we've just seen like in past years, you know, when K state's played some pretty grueling seasons, they've been taxed in the injury department at times. Like they also have a number of significant guys that just, they wouldn't even play anyways. Like Kleiman was already talking about yesterday, certain guys that aren't going to, you know, partake in parts of spring practice or any parts of it. So it's just like you said, there's already the risk of losing guys, and then you just have other guys that they're not going to be a part of it all. So uh, what what's the joy other than thinking that, you know, maybe that wide receiver that's been talked about for three and a half years is actually going to do something this season? He's not. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the way things work out. Yeah, and, and then there's some guys that are still banged up enough to where they can't play, right? And mm -hmm. look at it this way. Kansas State's got 12 games on the schedule. They hope that it's 13, right? They hope that it's 14. Yeah, they hope that it's at least – well, I said 13 because of a Big 12 championship game, but obviously uh, you hope to get to the 12-team playoff as well. I get that. So you're hoping it's at least 14. I mean, we're continuing continuing to add games to the schedule. Uh, personally, I think Kansas State's going to be playing 13 more often than not. Uh especially when you go to the 12 game with the current conference layout being what it is. And then even beyond 25, if it changes to a 14 game where you get two automatic bids, perhaps for the big 12. So, uh, and, and, and that's probably not going to last that long too. I, I mean, college football is changing fast and we're going to get to where we're going sooner rather than later, whether that's the, you know, the super league stuff that's being discussed or, or whatnot. But at the end of the day, Kansas state, yeah, we, I remember when the spring games were a lot more popular. That's when teams were playing like 10, 11 games yeah. a season. Now you're you're probably playing 13 or so. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, let's dive into what Chris Kleiman said on Monday. That's uh, when he opened up everything. We we're recording this on Tuesday, March 5th. So uh, at this stage, K-State actually probably already has their first practice in the books, uh, got it taken care of. Uh, there were a couple things that he hit on that were significant. Obviously, he talked about some of the newcomers. There's obviously been changes to the staff. Quarterback is always a hot topic because of Avery Johnson, but also the fact that, you know, I, I point this out to people, K-State has had a go to their backup quarterback in every season under Chris Kleiman except for his first in 2019. And so while 
you know, Avery Johnson has kept himself clean from injuries in high school in his first year of college football. The way this game is played, it just lends itself to quarterbacks having to miss time. I think we talked about it. Maybe it was you and I, or at least Fan and Drew and I, and we discussed over the last two years, you could probably go and find almost every team in the Big 12 has had to go at least one or two game stretches where they have been without their starting quarterback. Obviously, we know like KU has a supremely talented quarterback, but he's not been able to stay on the field. And we saw uh, this season, Quinn Ewers at Texas was not able to stay on the field. Dylan Gabriel last year at Oklahoma, um, West Virginia played like 44 quarterbacks last season. So not this past year, but the year before that, the one that almost got Neil Brown fired. And, and Oklahoma State, the, they, they were going with a, basically a three-man rotation at quarterback to begin the year. Texas Tech hasn't had a healthy quarterback since – uh, the Reagan since the, yeah, okay. I was gonna go further. I was gonna say Nixon, but yeah, you're <laughs> probably right. Uh, it's at least one of those uh, presidents that I wasn't alive for. And, and and you see it in the NFL too. It's just like we're asking these guys to play more games. You're you're going to get more yeah. injuries. It's going to happen. I know what you're delving into. Where Chris Kleiman talked about the depth of quarterback and needing to develop that. They're going to rely on Jacob Knuth, I think I believe at least at first uh, to be that guy. So they're really going to have their eyes on him in the spring and allow him to prove that he is good enough to be the number two or allow him to prove that maybe you need to go get somebody else. Yeah. Here is what Chris Kleiman said when asked about the quarterbacks on Monday. An awful lot. Um, you know, we're going to give uh, all of our young players an opportunity uh, to compete. I'm excited for Jacob Knuth, uh, who's now been in the, in the program. It was good for Jacob to take all those reps uh, as the backup to Avery in the bowl game. And I think it was his chance to really learn what we're doing offensively. Uh, now he needs to take that next step. Avery needs to take that 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 next step and continue um, to build upon what Avery did throughout the bowl prep. And I'm excited for for both those guys and for all those quarterbacks with Coach Wells in the room, um, somebody that's a, a, an established really – a professional guy that uh, understands all the details of being a quarterback and, um, you know, him mixing with Coach Riley. We're going to do some different things offensively, but uh, I'm excited for those guys to make that next step. So we, we talked about quarterback. It's probably a week, week and a half ago at this point now and, and kind of highlighted that you got four guys on this roster that are playing quarterback essentially and – there's not a lot of experience there. I mean, Kellen Samonsik has played the most college quarterback, but it was all at Washburn. And even, you know, at the DT level there, he was hurt last year, so he didn't play a ton. Blake Barnett is a true freshman. So your only really true depth that you're counting on here is on Jacob Knuth, who, again, you know, is, he, he came to K-State, transfer from Minnesota as a walk-on. And then Avery Johnson, who played a handful of games last year, with this spring period, we know that there will be another portal window that opens up. I mean, what are the chances that K-State is looking for another quarterback? But probably more so than that, what are the chances that they can find somebody that actually fits what they're looking for? Because you're not looking for somebody that has the true illusion of, hey, you could play. It's you're only going to play if something really bad happens. Yeah, I mean, it will come down to how – Jacob Knuth looks in the spring. Even then, you might still want one because you feel probably a little thin in general, um, even if he impresses enough that you probably need to go out and get someone. Uh, and, and that will be the chore. Not impossible. We've seen it done before with KU. I think with Jason Bean almost uh, was a similar situation. I think mean, Oregon, they went out and got Dylan Gabriel, but they got Dante Moore at the same time who was a starter at times last year from UCLA and a pretty decorated uh, five-star recruit just a year ago. So it's not impossible, but you are asking someone to come in and essentially say you probably have no shot to be this team's primary starter for perhaps two years, uh, and then we'll we'll look at it afterwards. But, you know, they can't tell them. You know, <laughs> there is a chance there, that you'll still get an opportunity because the guys just don't stay healthy. Uh, for two straight years either. So you'll you'll get your chance. You're probably just going to have to wait on it. That's a tough sell, uh, not an impossible one, but it is a tough sell. In terms of having similarities to the quarterback depth situation, running back is a spot that 
it, really there it's it's a direct comparison. You have DJ Giddens who is you know comparable to Avery Johnson in terms of you got a really really good running back, and I think people recognize that DJ Giddens is good, but I I wonder if there are some out there that that don't fully understand just how good he was last year and what the expectation moving forward could be. But then behind that, you lost Trayshawn Ward, who transferred to Boston College, uh, who was, I think, really quality depth last year. I mean, he had his moments of up and down, but I, I you know, I, I think that you you had a guy there at least that his upside was that of a starting running back in the Big 12, and now you're relying on really young guys or guys that have some serious weaknesses. So what does the running back situation look like for K-State, and, and what did you think uh, of Chris Kleiman's comments on it yesterday. Yeah, it'll be interesting. The guy that you got returning is someone that is, I only think has five carries, um, if I remember correctly, and that's Joe Jackson, who's the richer freshman out of Florida, um, that I think they still are excited about. And look, DJ Giddens didn't really play at all his true freshman year, so just because he didn't doesn't mean to write him off, even for this year, because then DJ Giddens came back, I think ran for almost 600 yards his retro freshman year after not playing his first one on campus. So um, there is Joe Jackson. There is true freshmen that they are excited about as well, specifically Davon Rice out of Las Vegas, just because he has the ability to kind of be that home run guy, uh, a little bit more explosive than anyone else in the room, brings that element that maybe they were missing a year ago. I've, sa- I've said that a lot. I think him being so much different and a little bit more dynamic gives him an advantage and a potential opportunity to see the field quickly just because he can provide something that maybe the others can't. Um, I'm a little less concerned about the depth at running back than I am at quarterback too in general because of Rice, because of Jackson, but because it's a little bit easier to make your first mark in the backfield than it is under center. Uh, That's one of the positions also you can play early um, and it's a little bit simpler to do. So my concern isn't necessarily there in the backfield. And that's one of those where if there are guys in the portal after spring ball, that would be an easier one you would think to maybe get a flyer and somebody that you could have a better sell to where it's like, hey, look, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be getting 20 carries a game, but we can get you a couple. We have ways that we can use you. Uh, and that might be appealing to to anybody that is there, but we'll see what that market looks like uh, moving forward. One of the big additions in the offseason that wasn't a player was that of Matt Wells after Colin Klein moved on. So Connor Riley gets the bump to OC. You bring in a co-OC and your new quarterbacks coach is the former head coach at Texas Tech. Chris Kleiman has a longstanding relationship with Matt Wells, and uh, this is what he said about the importance and really the benefit of having Matt Wells on staff. Well, it helps me because it gives me another sounding board of somebody to visit with uh, that's got head coaching experiences, that's been in my shoes, been in my seat, um, and understands the day-to-day operations um, for me to bounce ideas off of, but also just somebody that's that's been in the profession, that's somebody that's you know, he's coordinated, he's coached quarterbacks, he's been a head coach. Some of the calming things that he has for our offense and, and pushing Coach Riley and, and pushing our offensive staff to, to continue to, to find more ways to do things, uh, maybe easier ways, simpler ways. Uh, I, I'm excited that to some of the things that he's brought to our pass game um, that uh, we'll get to start working on this spring. But uh, he's been uh, he's been everything that I thought he, he has been, and, and it's been fun for him because I've just seen Matt just jump in with our staff and with our players and, and build relationships really quickly. We've talked a lot about Matt Wells over the last couple of months that he's been here, but now that we hit March, uh, what are your impressions of what he's done since he's gotten here and kind of how he'll impact the staff and the team? Yeah, he's been like a jolt of energy, I will say that. It just seems like he has a little bit more of a, a charisma than I gave him credit for uh, in his own in his own little way. Uh, it seems like he was very, very excited and couldn't wait for this opportunity and has kind of hit the ground running and hasn't really eased himself into it. Uh, he's jumped in with two feet and, and really made his mark. And I agree with you know Chris Kleiman, some of the stuff he said there, especially having a first-time play call with Connor Riley. And I think the – awareness almost of Matt Wells will help just knowing and having a firmer grasp of everything more than a typical assistant would 
because of the different chairs that he has been in and the fact that um, if there's anything you can say about Matt Wells' coaching pedigree and his coaching career, um, it's not necessarily anything about play calling. It's not necessarily anything bad or good about him as a head coach, even though there was some, there was a lot of good at Utah State and probably better than what people think at Texas Tech. It still wasn't good enough. But at the end of the day, you know that he can develop quarterbacks. And I think that's probably what's the most exciting thing about him, just because you're trying to coordinate perhaps the school's most decorated recruit ever at that particular position. It's interesting that you, you bring up the the energy and kind of charisma of Matt Wells because that's something that I would have never anticipated him being when he got here, but I think he's been really good from that point of view for uh, a lot of things. Like I think there's a, a good reinvigoration there, and I think that – he yeah. can he can kind of take the lead on a lot of things for this staff in terms of being kind of that and not like a rah rah guy in a bad way, but I, I just think he's done a nice job of not overdoing it, but you know having the social media presence, being energized and excited about this, and I think that probably goes to his his background and the situation he was put in. Like he got a raw deal at Texas Tech, they hired a guy that was not a good fit for them, and they wanted out of that instantly, and so they cut ties pretty early. And, you know, he, he kind of held on the last couple of years as an analyst at Oklahoma. Now he's back into it full time. And like Matt Wells, if everything goes well here, this is not a job that he wants to have for five years. This is a job that he wants to have for two, three years. And then he's back to being a head coach somewhere, I would imagine. And I think that having that that kind of drive in that spot is a really good thing because obviously Colin Klein had that because like. Colin's a bright mind. Everybody's been on him for a while. Like the Colin Klein story doesn't end with him just being the AM offensive coordinator for a while. It's ultimate goal would be for him to be a head coach. So I think it's good to have a guy with that kind of ambition and energy. Uh, and he's also learned things now. Like he knows, okay, this is what didn't work for me at Texas tech. He saw how things were done in Norman. Like he's, he's a pretty cultured dude. And on top of that, like you said, He's done things with a lot of good quarterbacks and, you know, is, was instrumental in Jordan Love becoming a first round draft pick by the Packers. So it's going to be interesting and exciting to kind of see how he continues, especially now that you get more of the on field coaching uh, to come out of him. And he certainly has his work cut out for him with the best of the best in Avery Johnson and then trying to build reasonable depth behind him with the current quarterback situation at K State. Yeah. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the with the term reinvigoration. I think that's what it was. He almost reset his career, kind of probably got aligned better with what he wanted and, and kind of got to take in everything and get a better perspective on what, what is what had happened and what he wanted to do. And now I just think we're seeing the impact of a guy that couldn't wait to become a coach again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything else personnel wise or in like notability with the team and the schedule of spring stick out to you yesterday with what Chris Kleiman said? No, I mean, everyone wanted to talk about having two practices before spring break and then coming back, but that's something that they've always had to do. So I didn't really take too much. Uh, and it's not there. These are not like their hardcore serious spring practices. He made that clear yesterday too. It's like, Essentially, it's like the hey, the NCAA, their rules say we got to do it like this. Like we're getting them out of the way before spring break, and then we'll come back and hit it hard. Yeah, and you and you can't start any earlier. I mean, you could have this year, I guess, because the weather was cooperating. But typically, the weather isn't cooperating to a point you're going to start it any earlier. And you can't start it after spring break either, because you get back then, and then it gets leaks too far into April, and then you're missing out on a recruiting open period that other yeah. coaching staffs are taking advantage. So you don't really have much of an option. So I thought too much of was put into that. Chris Kleiman did say he was asked what, what two positions he was most curious to watch during spring ball. And, and the ones that came to mind for him were um, offensive line and linebacker, of course, offensive line, because you got to revamp that position. So you're watching some of the young guys, like he pointed out, would be the three that we would have pointed out, being John Pastore, Andrew Leingang, and Sam Hecht. And that linebacker, because it's a little bit of a carousel there right now with some guys moving positions out of the linebacker room, some guys moving positions 
into the linebacking room. You do have two veterans with Desmond Purnell and Austin Moore, but the other guys are kind of banged up. So who's going to be there? Who's not? So there's a little bit of a carousel there and maybe some unknowns that you still have to develop as well. Yeah. All right. The last thing I wanted to throw in here, this didn't have anything to do with the spring in terms of the current team. Now it does have some impact on recruiting in the spring, but you, know, you asked him about the possibility of the June signing period, and Chris Kleiman uh, seems to be all about it. I, I'd be a proponent of it. I, I, I think it's a great idea um, for a variety of reasons. The easiest thing would be the fact that um, these kids, for the most part, know where they want to go. Uh, all of them are, are making all their <clears throat> visits in the summer. Uh, I think it would clean some things up for everybody if we had that signing period, whatever it's the last Wednesday in June. Um it allows us as coaches to know who we're tracking academically. Uh, I know that's one of the concerns, but you know I, I'm not tracking maybe 300 kids in in the fall. We're tracking maybe the 15 we'd sign and another 30 or 40 that potentially could sign. I think it'd be I think it'd be a positive. I think it would it would make quality of life for assistants a little bit better um, in the in the fall as opposed to you know. You're still calling guys, but you're shrinking that list to call. You may be going out and seeing a guy or two in your open week, watch a game. But um, I think it'd be a positive. I don't know if it's going to pass, but I think it'd be a real positive. I, I think you and I are both in agreement with Chris Kleiman. It just seems to make a lot of sense and do a lot of good for uh, the, the way college football is set up if you were to add that period in June. Because uh, my whole thing on this is, these guys know most of them already commit verbally, like let them sign if they want to sign, because think of how many guys you'll talk to and they say, yeah, I want to have it wrapped up by the start of my senior football season. Well, let them actually wrap it up and not make this thing carry into December. And even though they've said, you know, for a year now, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm committed to here. You still got guys calling and bothering, let them make their decision and make it final and make it a lot easier on these coaches and everybody else. And I, so I, you know, I, I hope it happens. And I, if you can find any negatives with the June signing period, I think you're just trying to be a curmudgeon and be pissed off about something. Uh, Cause I, I don't see any downside to it. The only downside would be the SEC being pissed that they can't, you know, just go and take someone like, cause it levels the playing field a bit. True. I Deal with the losers. They, yeah, like so, they're the ones I think that are probably fighting back on it the most, uh, just because you all these teams could get their guy that maybe would flip later. You know what I mean? Now, can't say flips guys from lesser schools too. They just did with Davon Rice, right? Late the running back out of Las Vegas. So there's going to be at the teams are going to have to make some decisions sooner rather than later. Like if you you're if you are considering slow playing a guy, you might not be able to do that. So you can't do that. Um, now, on the flip side, if there's a guy that you have committed and you and at the end you kind of have second thoughts about and you kind of encourage him to go elsewhere, uh, you can't get out of that anymore because he signed in June um, before you maybe told on yourself by the way that he performed his senior year of high school that gave you his second thoughts. So there's a lot that goes into it. So if people wanted to go draw back and be having a little less freedom of wiggle room there or the SEC not being able or, or, or school, not just the SEC, any school, I'll say this, like at the end, like, Oh crap, this guy's actually good. And, and, you know, basically um, over offer in IL to get get him. It it eliminates that. So in, in my opinion, it eliminates some of the bad stuff that's kind of, encompass this sport um but at the end of the day it's going to force coaches into making decisions a little bit sooner but i do do think it takes the burden off of coaches because you're recruiting less guys during the season it takes the burden off kids that want the burden off and if they don't want to they don't have to sign in june so it's not like this is you know forcing them into anything that they they don't want they can still i mean they're they're still really good prospect signing in February still at this point, this past cycle. So, yeah, and if there was a something bad, it, they would talk about, well, what, what if a coaching change happens? Uh, they already have the, the ability to get out of that for the most part. If, if, if a kid wants to get out of something because if something like a coaching change happened, 
they can get out of it at this point. I think we've seen that enough. Yeah, I think that's a that's 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 a good point. Like the coaching staffs and the players, they still have the power to not take advantage of this if they want to, but at least give the opportunity to the players that want it and, you know, give some peace of mind to the coaches then that, you know, if 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 Avery Johnson commits to you uh, on 4th of July, uh, don't don't have to wait till December for that thing to, to become official. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and uh, if it does actually get passed. One element to consider here, and, and this might – and this this is feasible now because there is no one-time transfer rule. You could transfer as much as you want, essentially. We've solved this in the past cycle. Julian Sayan forever was committed to Alabama, and he was an early enrollee. And he early enrolled. Alabama, whatever, something happened. He goes in the transfer portal, and now he's a Buckeye already. Now you could get a kid committed in June, signed in June, and if he's an early enrollee, he could just enter the portal if he was tampered with after the fact. Like, that's going to be the new decommitment commitment then, right? It won't be like, oh, I committed in June, never did. But we had to wait to sign until December. So at that point, I just flipped already in October or November to the other school that was recruiting me and that, that started to pursue me. Now I signed that national letter in intent in June. Schools technically can't talk to me, but it'll be like the transfer portal. They'll talk to uh, my friend, my mom, my dad, you know, whatever it is, or or there'll be some kind of liaison in between. So we really want them, um, but you've already signed a letter of intent, so we can't get them. Uh, so after he enrolls, just already enter the transfer portal and we'll get them that way. That that can happen now. That'll be the new flipping will be that you flip a guy that's signed at, by, by because he's an early enrollee. Now, if he's not an early enrollee, that's a little bit tougher to do. If he's an early enrollee, just – get him to enter the transfer portal uh, basically a day a day after being on campus at the first school. That'll be the new thing. I don't think that – that's just not a scenario I think happens enough to not make this still beneficial. Yeah, and uh, also, like, you know, it's it's going to be unique circumstances where a coaching change happens, but like like at Alabama where uh, Julian Sayan did it because, you know, Nick Saban's not there. So, you know, what's the point of Alabama if Nick Saban's not there? So – We'll see how it plays out, but it's something that's out there and uh, a possibility. But that will do it for us. Talking spring football, we'll have more throughout the week on K-State football as well as some K-State basketball. We'll see uh, how things go in Lawrence on Tuesday night uh, because, you know, it, it could really change the mood around here if something wild happened in that building. But uh, hopes will not be high for that. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. For more K-State online, head over to On3. Go find what you need there football recruiting, team news, uh, everything else, and uh, plenty of other things that you can find. Also, the On3 National stuff, good as well, uh, because, you know, Andy Staples has K-State as one of the big boys. They are in the Super League, so uh, take We're going that. going to the peasant. SEC. Going to yep. the SEC. Yep, SEC bound uh, the next time realignment happens, so uh, no worries there. Uh, we're out of here, and uh, I'm going to go take care of a daughter that is crying and has probably a lot of pee in her pants. <laughs>